Right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Claire Baker, MSP, and I'm convener of the Economy and Fair Work Committee in Parliament. This is the 19th year of the Festival for Politics, and thank you very much for coming to this session um, this afternoon. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and hearing um, everybody's point of view. I'll remind people that there can be differences of opinion, and if everybody can act respectfully, respectfully towards each other, that would be much appreciated. Um, later on, I will be asking uh, for questions and comments from the audience. Um, and if you're keen to continue your thoughts, to let you know that the, you can use the at Visit Scottish Parliament uh, channel or on Instagram, you can put thoughts up in there. And just to remind everybody, the event has been live streamed onto Scottish Parliament television. Uh, so I'm delighted today to be joined by Catherine McWilliam, Raphael Peels, who is joining us online, uh, Ross Foye and Professor Patricia Finlay. Um, as quick introductions, Catherine uh, McWilliams is National Director of the Institute of Directors in Scotland and as an organisation they are passionate about promoting good governance and diverse leadership. Um, Dr Raphael Peels, who is joining us online, works for the Bureau for Workers' Activities of the International Labour Organisation in Geneva. Um, Ros Foye is General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress and has been an active trade union member for over 30 years, which is making both of us feel old now, Ros. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Patricia Finlay is Distinguished Professor of Work and Employment uh, Relations and Director of the Scottish Centre for Employment Research at the University of Strathclyde. So thank you all for coming along um, this afternoon. Um, if I may start with a first question uh, to the panel. Uh, which is about, I suppose, the relevance of the trade union uh, movement in the UK and in Scotland today. Um, as I said, Ros has been involved in the trade union movement for over um, 30 years. And I first met Ros when she was a young um, trade unionist. Um, she's still in the movement, but we know that trade union membership has um, fallen over the last few decades. It's not the only institution that's happened to. If you look at church membership or other membership, you know, that's maybe a symptom of the way in which we live our lives, that there's a reduction in certain areas. But I'm going to come to Rose, first of all, and talk about, yeah. you know, do you feel that trade unions are relevant to the modern workplace and modern society? Yeah, well, unsurprisingly, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I actually think there's a very strong argument that they've never been more mm. relevant uh, than they have over the past couple of years. Um, what we've seen, uh, and I think this is part of human nature, when, when people have been treated unjustly, they find ways to come together and organise themselves in order to exercise some collective power. And what we've seen, certainly in Scotland, uh, is an unprecedented level over the past couple of years of trade union activity and of workers coming together and fighting back to get decent pay and working conditions at a time when the pendulum has really swung so far against them that, you know, coming together and, and exercising that collective power has been the only way they've been able to get results and get results they have because over the past year, uh, workers managed to get through negotiated collective uh, bargaining agreements, over £2 billion worth of pay rises into their pockets. And more than half of that wouldn't actually have been delivered if workers hadn't voted to take strike action and, and delivered successful industrial action campaigns. So here in Scotland, not only are we relevant and making a real difference, you could argue actually that the trade union movement has been the biggest force for wealth redistribution in Scotland in the past two years, eh, given the additional money that we've got into ordinary working people's pockets. And that has an impact on areas that aren't organised as well, because what it does in a tight labour market is bring pay up right across the whole economy. So, you know, if you want to raise pay and conditions, you need trade unions, you need collective bargaining. And I think more and more young people eh, and people right across our population are waking up to the fact that politicians aren't going to do it for us. The bosses aren't going to do it for us. Workers have to do it for themselves and they have to get organised. But are we seeing an increase in membership or is it change in the industries in which membership is stronger? Well, sure, we've because seen... You know, the success yeah, of a trade union, you yeah. think you would see more people want to join a trade union. But well, actually, if you look at the it? rates of people that are joining trade unions, they are very strong. Uh, trade union membership, uh, in terms of the affiliation of the STUC in recent years, has been growing steadily. 
Um, and what we've and that's in a context where actually the age, when you think of all the people dropping off, because the age profile has been quite high over the past decade or so. Uh, when you look at COVID and the amount of older people that left the, la the labour market, um, I'm actually, I see it as a sign of real success that we are still on a, a positive trajectory there. Um, Sure, we are half the size we were in the 1970s. A lot of that is about the industries that where workers work changing so quickly. And there are a lot of areas where workers, you know, in, in precarious contracts haven't collectivised and haven't got organised. But there's lots of evidence that they're starting to do so. So if we look at the, the Amazon workers globally, they're using a uh, global communication to egg each other on to get organised at warehouses right across the world. It's happening here in the UK, it's happening massively in America and in many other countries. We've seen the Apple workers in Glasgow at the Apple store, young people get together and become one of the first Apple stores in Europe to get organised and win a collective agreement. So, you know, we're seeing some really exciting seeds of change. We're seeing young workers in Unite Hospitality uh, come together in the, the hospitality industry and start to deliver direct actions because they might not be able to get recognition, but they realise that they can win important conditions by acting collectively and taking direct action. So I, I think that it's not just about uh, overall numbers. You know, after 30 years of neoliberal governments that have done everything they can to dismantle the trade union movement, the fact that we're still here we're the biggest membership organisation in Scotland. Um, we're over 600,000 strong, I think, is a testament to the fact that, you know, we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I'll maybe ask um, Dr Peels uh, to come in if he would want to provide a kind of international perspective on relevance of trade unions. Um, you know, Ross referred to Amazon workers cooperating internationally. Is that a common kind of approach or are you seeing countries where trade unionism is, is growing at a faster rate than we see here? Um, thank you so much, Chair, and, and I hope everybody's uh, hearing me well and uh, particularly greetings to the, to the General Secretary. Um, yes, um, I, I believe that uh, trade unions are more relevant than ever. I think there are a lot of challenges, pressures, crises uh, going on. I, mean, I think we tend to refer to that as a uh, poly, uh, a poly crisis. But I think what uh, over time uh, has been shown by unions is I think a lot of resist, uh, resilience. I think during um, COVID-19, um, trade unions um, showed a lot of um, positive examples of uh, protecting most precarious workers, negotiating uh, wage protection, um, um, defending frontline workers, um, etc. However, I think it's important to recognize um, we tend to uh, look at on the one hand when we uh, discuss trade union membership and influence, as, um, as uh, Ross mentioned before, it's not only about members, but um, it's also to a certain extent uh, about members. Um, we have external challenges and internal challenges for unions. I think the external challenges are massive. I think there's um, a lot of violations of trade union rights uh, in the world. You have the changing employment relationship. I think if you prefer to, to keep work, to platform work, um, I think that is a, a manifestation of, of a changing employment relationship. Uh, we have globalization. We have highly unionized sectors that disappear and move to the global south uh, with often weaker unions or uh, emerging sectors in the global north um, where maybe we're less uh, unionizing. So you have, I think, a complicated environment for unions to work in. On the other hand, there are also internal challenges. Um, I think in the description of this panel, uh, youth is uh, particularly highlighted. Um, it is key that also young workers are represented through unions, but also, for instance, are represented in decision making um, of unions. So then if you have a look at external challenges, internal challenges, then if that is reflected in trade union membership, then if you have a look at the global figures and we look at figures in different regions uh, in the world, then we see that trade union membership is going down over time. That's rather systematically over the past decades in all regions in the world, um, irrespective of the level of development. So that means both in developed and um, developing countries. Um, we also see that that is stronger for um, uh, people in non-standard or the most precarious types of employment, independent workers, the gig workers, temporary workers, the over-the-count workers, um, etc. So 
what that shows is that these non-standard forms of employment or this um, this um, increasingly diverse range of, of of employment is not only a threat to workers because often these type of um, um, employment relationships um, are characterized by important decent work deficits but it's also resulting in lower levels of unionization so it's also dangerous um, for, uh, for trade unions um, some positive news though over the past years there are um, positive examples of organizing these uh, very hard to organize workers self-employed own account workers if you don't have a look from a global perspective in the global south it could be base speakers those in the north translators journalists actors musicians interpreters which are a little bit um the the previous generation of what today would be the geek workers you know this they were already like uh, independent workers um as ILO we or as ACTRAF we um we we try to reflect a little bit upon the um these key um challenges with regard to membership by means of four scenarios um and i only put this um to the front as food for thought um we have a first dystopian one uh, which is a depressing one so if um membership uh, continues to to decrease um then unions um, can become more marginalized um, um it can be more aging unions if you're not able to organize the young workers that's the marginalization scenario the second scenario is the dualization scenario where you have a look at the labor market from a dual system so trade unions are able to defend themselves there where they are traditionally strong so these workers in a stable employment relationship in big companies in the public sector however at the cost of not necessarily representing a whole group of workers um, then the third scenario would be replacement that is referring to trade unions being in competition with other actors such as ngos community-based organizations but also, for instance, private lawyers. So, um, these organizations are already working with the same people, with the same workers. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth scenario is the feel good story that's revitalization that those um, sectors, those countries, those topics um, where tradings are able to renew, to uh, come up with solutions to these new challenges, to come up with innovative tactics to organize all workers, including um, in, this, in this changing economy. Um, um, to come up with uh, relevant services, including, for instance, digital service, um, including new approaches and social dialogue in the globalized economy, um, etc. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, when we come to um, Patricia, um, so while, you know, in Scotland, Raphael's talked about gig economy, and in Scotland we have fair work uh, commitments, um, but we still have a gig economy, we still have lots of people who are in um, very short-term contracts and, and that type of employment. How do, what role do you think trade unions have in, do you think there's issues that need to be resolved and what role do trade unions have in, in how we improve workers' terms and conditions and how they match up with what government commitments and ambitions are? So, so picking up on some of the points that have been made already, I mean, trade unions are still the biggest membership organisation in the UK as well as Scotland. We still see a very strong association between the presence of trade unionism and a whole range of good working conditions. So it's not just about the pay premium that comes from union membership, but it's also about um, are you more likely to get access to flexible working? Are you more likely to be involved in conversations around health and safety or around um, internal company decision making. So we know that there's a, a lot of really strong associations. And I guess what Raphael talked about in terms of dualism, there's lots of places where trade unionism is, trade unionism is, is, is strong and it produces really positive outcomes for their own individual members. I think turning to the kind of broader fair work agenda in Scotland, it's very clear um, that what underpins that agenda is not simply that trade unions are good for members but that trade unions are also good in producing outcomes that are positive for, for businesses and for society as a whole. So if you look at the kinds of engagement which people like Ros and, and other trade union officials and, and trade union activists will have across Scotland, they will be engaged in policy discussions around fair work very broadly, and I'm happy to come back to that. They'll be engaged in discussions about the skills system. They'll be engaged in discussions about gender equality. So there's a lot of places in which the expertise of trade unionism is currently heavily involved in engaging with policy and policy makers. 
And so that part about do you deliver for your members, we've, we've seen a wave of, of strikes and industrial actions, and we can look at the extent to which that delivers for trade union members individually. But I, I think if you hark right back to Alan Flanders in the 50s, trade unions also have a role as a sword of justice. Mm -hmm. So they produce outcomes that are not just for trade unions themselves, not trade union members themselves. Mm -hmm. Quite often, with collective bargaining coverage, they produce outcomes for people who are not trade union members that are directly instrumentally beneficial to them. But they're also engaged in a whole lot of civic organisations, policy engagement, um, campaigning, which produces outcomes that, that at a societal level and an economic level are very positive. So in terms of when we discuss fair work in Scotland, we're picking up on all of those rules that giving fair work produces for us as a nation as well as individually. We think fair work matters because having a good job is associated with very, very positive outcomes for individuals. It's good for your income. It's good for your health, both now and in the future. Um, it's good for your family life. It's good for your ability to engage in your local community or in, in, in civic society. We know that having a good job, predictable hours, a decent level of income allow, facilitates you to do lots of other really good things. But we also know that that, also, that helps in discussions with employers about um, restructuring or about responding to challenges that businesses and other organisations face. And we know that that's a very positive part of what's behind the Fair Work Agenda in Scotland. Not just that it benefits individuals who are in work and in trade unions or not, but it benefits us all because it produces a better model of economic functioning in which we use our resources better to produce out stronger outcomes and we share in those um, more, we redistribute those in a far better way. I have to come to um, Catherine about employers' views of trade unions, because I used to work for, my first trade union job was working for um, Unite, who um, were amicus at the time, and when I started, that was in 2002, the debate then was, was a lot about how do uh, employers and trade unions work cooperatively together, how do we increase productivity, how do we increase terms and conditions by working uh, very closely together and have a shared agenda. And I would say under the current UK government, you know, there are efforts there to uh, restrict the rights of trade unions and to, to restrict their ability to take direct action. Um, where do kind of, employers and directors, in terms of the perception of the relationship with trade unions, where do you think that's at, at the moment? To be honest, I think it's a spectrum, depending on the sector and the industry that you're in, and it would be very difficult to give you a one-size-fits-all answer. What I can speak to is the conversations that we've had with, directly with IOD members who predominantly are running SME um, organisations. And what I would say is there's a real willingness to really look at how you can be the best employer you can be just now. My members are recognising that they don't necessarily have the, you know, the turnover or the power to be able to just up salaries in line with inflation. So they're looking at other ways that they can stand up for their employees and be better. And I think that would indicate a real positive um, you know, swing on the spectrum. But likewise, there are others out there that are just completely opposed. So I, I think it would be fair to say you know, there is no one size fits all and it, it would be a case by case kind of mm. basis. But I certainly feel that there is a, a willingness there to look at how we can be better because actually right now, post COVID, you know, we are seeing an incredibly engaged workforce who are very aware of, of their rights and looking at, you know, how they can get the most out of their employment. It's not just about a job that you go to and you bring home a salary. It's what's the purpose of the organisation that you work for? What do they stand for? And there are a lot of people that are applying those types of conditions when it comes to working for an organisation. It's not just about how much is the salary? How does that compare to you know, the biggest competitor? So short answer would be there's a real spectrum but a willingness there. Because mm. we are in a very tight labour market at the moment yes. and inflation is higher than it's been in, you know, in my adult working life, um, which is making, you know, Roger, you talked about pay claims, mm. is making it, pay, pay claims at the same time as being necessary because people are dealing with a cost of living crisis, is maybe making it difficult for some of the people that Catherine represents to, to meet those concerns because they are dealing with inflationary pressures. So how much has the trade union movement um, do you know, Catherine talks about other areas, whether it's about more flexible working or 
that can be given as benefits to employers? Is that something, to employees, that's, is that something? I that mean, that's something, day in, day out, the things that hit the, the media headlines are the, when, when an industrial action takes place and, and we end up in that sort of situation. But, you know, right across our economy, um, across the, the private sector, the voluntary sector, trade unionists are negotiating with employers um, and, you know, there have been outcomes like, you know, things like moving to a four day week, um, reduced working hours for those em employers who haven't been in a position perhaps to make uh, pay rises. The whole, you know, the whole basket of conditions of work are always on the agenda. And, you know, often it's trade unions that are actually bargaining around skills and diversification with their employer as well. If they can see the writing on the wall in a particular company or industry, often it's the, it's the trade unions that are uh, talking to the employer about diversification that may well be lobbying government uh, for, for investment to certain industries. Uh, you know, because they care about the longevity of the, the jobs of the workers in there. If, if we even look at, you know, the whole offshore oil and gas industry at the moment, there is a huge uh, amount of activity taking place by the unions who organise workers in those areas. Not just, you know, blankly saying we don't want to see this industry shut down. What they're doing is they're lobbying government to make sure that the new industries coming in uh, will entitle the workers to transition over into things like renewables. So, you know, there are active conversations taking place about skills passports and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there is a whole plethora of negotiation around the equalities agenda, around terms and conditions, and also around industrial and economic strategy that trade unions get really centrally involved in because they want to see security, sustainability and high quality uh, jobs for their members. That's what our members expect of us. So it's, it's, it's about much more than just simple paying conditions. And what about public perception of trade unions? Do you think people generally understand that? Because what they'll see, as you, as you said, is the headlines, mm. where there's a big strike happening and it's about usually about pay is what, it's maybe yeah. about more than that, but pay is what reaches the, the media or that's what's reported on. Do you think there's yeah. public sympathy for trade unions? Because we have gone through, you know, teachers have been on strike, that puts pressure right. on parents, um, mm -hmm. healthcare workers are going on strike, that means operations can get cancelled. So the public are feeling the effects of some of the significant mm -hmm. strikes. Do you feel there's still yeah. public support and an well, understanding for why people are? I think we're in action? we're in a, because of the pressures that are on our whole class workers right across the economy. I think people very well understand why workers are are forced uh, to the, the point of taking action. And actually, having been on literally hundreds of picket lines over the past. Uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, what I can tell you is they're more like many rallies than picket lines. The amount of beeps that you're getting from the public uh, are, are unbelievable. The amount of messages of support trade unions are getting into their branch offices and uh, their headquarters uh, from members of the public. As n we've never seen anything like this and it's as if the, the UK government in particular, I do differentiate between the UK government and the Scottish government. I, I think the Scottish government at least see trade unions as a serious social partner that has something mm. to contribute. They don't always give us what we want, but they will talk to us. The UK government sees trade unions as almost like economic terrorists um, and that, that, that creates a very different approach. But what we've seen is a public who are largely supportive because they, they can't pay their bills. They understand, they can't feed their kids. They can't heat their homes. Um, and most of them work in, you know, all of the places that are, that are taking industrial action. So, or they have a, ma a family member who works in those areas. And I also think that post COVID, you know, we had all of those public sector workers mm -hmm out on the front line, putting themselves and their families at real risk. People died and something has snapped inside people's heads. The anger has got to a point where people are like, no, we need to do something about this. We're not taking this anymore. And you can really feel that uh, when you're out there talking to teachers, lecturers, transport workers, 
hospital workers, local government workers. Um, you know, I'm often quite angry when I'm on the TV and things, but it's because I've been speaking to these workers and I'm filled with fury at, at what they're having to go through. And, the, the, you know, they provide fantastic public services um, and we were all out clapping them and then we just threw them on the rubbish heap uh, when it came to rising costs and tried to blame them for inflation. It's not them that are to blame for inflation, it's the excessive profits that some parts of our economy are making right at the very top. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing people at the very top of the tree uh, making huge profits. We're seeing CEOs give themselves pay rises of 40% while they're giving workers 2% at the very bottom of, of the pile. That is completely unacceptable. Mm. And relevant to Rosie's points there, during the pandemic, there was all talk of we're going to build back better. That was kind of the catchphrase. Um, I mean, Patricia, do you feel that that catchphrase has... I mean, on the back of that, we then had that pandemic and then we had financial crisis created by Liz Truss's government was one of the key factors, you know, we're, we're in the situation, not the only thing there, but um, there was other pressures came on the back of the pandemic. Do you think the kind of we're going to build back better language has resulted in much change or any change? Oh, I, don't, I don't think the, the, the phrase build back better or levelling up was the other part of that from, from a UK government perspective. And this is not a political point in a, in a kind of constitutional or nationalist sense at all. I don't think that that has any real depth in embedding any of that in policy making. I don't think it was intended to or has produced much in the way of real change. I mean, you're absolutely correct, Claire, to say that things have happened. There has been a pandemic. Nobody predicted it. There has been another financial crisis, um, the war in the Ukraine. The challenge in all of these is that, I suppose the one way to think about all of those is we will never be in a position where there isn't some sort of crisis or challenge. The key issue is how we deal with those. What kind of architecture of dialogue do we have in, in place? How do we speak to each other? What institutions are there to allow us to make the sorts of discussions that Rose was talking about between workers, and the, their trade unions and employers to make those constructive and productive? And that's not to suggest that everything's easy or you could make it perfect. But you could have a dialogue that says, right, OK, we have a real challenge arising from X. What are the various ways in which we should support that? Or, or we, can, we can address that. When we talk about fair work, we're really interested in substantive things, so what actual things about your experience at work are different, are different are, and are high quality, but also processes. And I don't mean by that bureaucratic processes. How do people talk to each other in organisations? How do they resolve the very challenges that you've outlined? How do they respond to those in a way that is fair and equitable? And I think that that's somewhere where you really do need either for, for um, governments to be giving a strong lead or to have embedded institutions that, that keep that dialogue stable. One of the real challenges we have in, in Scotland and in the UK is that we don't have, we have a liberal market eco economy, we don't have the kinds of institutions that keep people like Ross in constant dialogue or her, her counterpart in, in England and Wales, that keep them in constant dialogue with government and policymakers or keep them in constant dialogue with employers. It happens in some sectors and not others. So we've got a very weak institutional setup in Scotland and the UK. I think what we've tried to do with fair work is to find a kind of voluntary way of replicating that. So we don't have the institutions, we don't have the works councils, we don't have the regular dialogue around formal roles in the skills system, for example. But through the fair work agenda, we've tried to say, can we create those, even although there are no powers to make them formally part of the system of employment relations, if you want to call it that, in Scotland. And that's always going to have challenges, but it's also got some benefits, because we can, we can be creative in some of those spaces and trying to find ways forward. So if you look, for example, at, at social care, um, the Conven Fair Work Convention did an inquiry in social care a few years ago. Um, we argued that quite a lot of the things about the commissioning of social care were creating outcomes that were always going to create poor jobs and that trade unions would be unhappy with. Um, and we've tried to find ways slowly and painstakingly to try and get to try and address that through a process of dialogue that informs um, Catherine's members and Rosie's members and the policy community and other you know, advisors and experts to be able to try and say, what can we do with that? So we're all, we will always have crisis. Um, they might not be quite as big as some of the ones we've had recently, but we will always have things. It might be AI, it might be technologies that mean that certain sectors or certain occupations will largely disappear. Those will always be our crises. 
but we need to find ways of having a stable, constructive response to crisis in which the pain and the benefits are shared. One of the real challenges I think we've had in labour relations in the UK is um, a willingness to share the pain when things are difficult, but less of a willingness to share the benefit when times are good. Mm -hmm. And that people have long memories in workplaces. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Peels, I don't know if you want to come in and comment on kind of post-pandemic environment for trade unions and employee relationships in a more international setting and where there's examples of where things have improved or where it's put more stress on situations. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, um, I couldn't agree more with what uh, the panelists um, just mentioned. Um, as ILO, we are a tripartite organization, so everything we do, we do that together um, between workers, government, and employers. So there's a whole idea of social dialogue, and that is a little bit the response that we tend to give, including in, in times of, of COVID-19. And, and I think we have been doing mappings um, where unions, for instance, have been involved in negotiations with their governments um, or directly and directly with employers to provide answers to to the, the biggest crisis um, that was brought about by Corona. So for us, social dialogue um, is the institution um, to provide answers um, to um, beat not only uh, Corona. Um, I think there was also a moment uh, where we saw a lot of new types of social dialogue, be it more ad hoc, be it online, um, et cetera, but as mentioned by, by the colleagues, um, uh, irrespective of, of the topic, can be um, economic uh, restructuring, it can be skills upgrading, it can be um, technological change, uh, AI, etc. Um, we always tend to come back to um, meaningful uh, social dialogue where the social partners sit together to, um, to provide answers um, to these challenges. Um, maybe a quick, uh, quick uh, reflection on on the one hand, COVID-19, and then the whole uh, public perception. I think also uh, during the crisis, um, we have seen that the frontline workers are um, um, really essential jobs. Um, and we're really working at the front line of our economy who have been uh, most uh, hard hit. And it are these workers that we uh, actually have to uh, defend. So that's actually uh, also a kind of a moment of opportunity to um, I think um, with having a positive public perception around these jobs to, to negotiate um, to negotiate wages around that. Um, but then also, I, I think we also have seen a kind of the, the post-COVID-19 uh, depression where we all thought that, okay, this is a, um, a crisis of the system. We will, re we will rethink our uh, economic system, um, economic dependency, um, inequality um, in our um, economy, whereas we also then have seen that in, in the entity the people who are in the most precarious um, employment, the most vulnerable workers who have been um, paying the price of, of that crisis. Um, so yes, I think that's, uh, that's uh, a double, a double story there. Mm -hmm. And Catherine, I don't know if you want to say a bit more about kind of post-pandemic and your members. And I'm wondering how many, do you know whether your members are the unionised workforces or it's mainly SMEs you, you work with? Do they tend to have lower? Mainly SMEs yeah. with lower, lower unionised yeah. numbers, yeah. yeah. And in terms of kind of post-pandemic, you talked about employers having to have more um, flexible workplaces and uh, due to kind of recruitment and retaining their workers given a cost of living crisis. But has the pandemic changed things? Because one thing we did talk about during the pandemic, and Ros might want to come in after you, was about people changing their place of work. So working more at home, what does that mean for the trade union movement? And what does that also mean for making sure people are working in a safe environment when they're not in the workplace? That kind of different relationship has that presented challenges for your directors it definitely has their responsibilities Ab absolutely and i mean we're definitely seeing a, a, again spectrum that's my word of the day but a, a real kind of spectrum when it comes to buy-in with flexible working and you know a mm. post-covid environment um, again, there's a real willingness there for leaders to have dialogue with, with our employees and colleagues around flexible working, but it won't surprise you to hear that many are concerned about productivity and, and you know the effect on kind of social culture. 
We're seeing those who run hard lines about, you know, getting back into the office and having so many days that you're there and you're very present, experiencing higher levels of turnover. Um, those who are more willing to engage are seeing a more engaged workforce. They're, they're hearing yeah. feedback from their workforce that they feel more, more valued. And I think in particular, we're, we're, we're hearing a lot of feedback that employers are... I have a lot of members who are perhaps in the twilight stages of their careers. So they've, you know, they've been around for a, a long while. And as Ross spoke to the, you know, the perpetual cycle of crisis that, that, that we're in right now, um, I've got a lot of members who you know, have been doing business for you know, 30 years. And they are now you know, dealing with a, a younger generation who are entering the labour market who are saying, well, you know, why would you not give me flexible working? Mm. You know, we, we, have, we have proved consistently that you know, we, we can do this. Why, why is this not an option? And again, there's a real kind of compromise that has to be made in the middle between different mindsets. And I think that's something that we are still transitioning in or, or from post COVID because we're still testing the waters, if I'm being honest, you know, we're, we're, we're still trying to work out what good looks like when it comes to best practice and, and kind of experience of both directors and employers. But we're also needing to recognise what doesn't work and talk about why that doesn't work so that we can create, a, you know, a more equal environment for people to explore options for them. Um, I think you just have to look at, you know, recent coverage around the likes of, you know, WeWork and Zoom. So Zoom have kind of, you know, very publicly that there is an irony there about an online platform encouraging people back into the office. But, you know, what does that actually mean when they've got, you know, people in, you know, across the world who work on international timescales? I know myself, I had an issue with my Zoom account about six months ago and I had to speak to somebody who, you know, could only speak to me at certain times of the day because they were, you know, working internationally. So how, how does that work when you've got clients that you're dealing with, you know, across the globe? So I think right now we're seeing that that transition start but it's going to take a while to settle into this to, and to really understand what the, you know, this new world of working looks like and the effect that it's had longer term on, on both the workforce and, and leaders. Mm -hmm. And Ross, what does that mean for the trade union movement? Are you looking at different priorities? And in some ways, yeah. the, um, do you know, is there, you're in a tight labour market. Does that present opportunities for trade unions or does it make workers more kind of individualistic? It's, they can call the shots more yeah. directly with an employer. Why do you need a union to do it? The employer is so desperate for people. If you've got the skills and you're what you're looking for, you can do it yourself. Well, start? I think there are pros and cons uh, with a tight labour market. It certainly makes, when workers come together, uh, it, it makes it slightly easier for them to get a win sometimes. Uh, but, you know, for even in a tight labour market, for a lot of individuals, the idea that you can go in and self-negotiate is, is still something that, you know, is not a reality for most workers. Um, and, I, you know, there's a real kind of... A lot of these things work for people who are doing well already. So even with the flexible working and the home working, that's all great if you have a big house, you've got a, a spare room that you can use as an office or you can build an office in your garden. Um, you're not sitting in your one-bedroom flat using your ironing board on your couch mm -hmm. to try and do your job, uh, you know. So... Uh, and, and there are issues around fuel bills. At a time when fuel is really high, some employers really have said, oh, well, we don't need an office anymore. You can all work from home. Um, you know, so actually, it's not just about employers pulling people back into the office. There's actually real issues about people being made to work at home with not a fit workstation that could cause all sorts of issues for them further down the line, with not a good working environment where they can excel and do well and, and get the support they need. So... A lot of what we've been negotiating as trade unions is quite complex. It's about getting a good hybrid working model. It's about making sure that a worker who needs a workstation to do their job in the office will still be able to access a good workstation if that's their preference. But equally, if they can do their job at home, that they're going to get the right support to be able to do that uh, at home and coming up with hybrid models. And that takes a bit of negotiation. It takes consulting with your workforce properly to find out what people's needs are and, is that um, taking, and giving workers yeah. a bit of choice. Is um, that taking place? Is our employers yeah, that's now exactly doing that? that is... what, where the bargaining agenda is yeah. at at the moment yeah. for many, many employers. Um, there's no one size fits all here. It's, it's quite a, a complex landscape. And equally, you're absolutely right, there are organising challenges for trade unions for, where employers have uh, said, uh, you know, we can go to a home working model. 
for a lot of younger workers coming into the workplace, that's quite isolating. You're not picking up a lot of the training and things you would get. You might never meet the union rep or get asked to join the union or, or, or get to go to a, a union meeting because you might just not find out about it. So it's really important that unions are thinking about making sure that their recognition agreements and access agreements are up to speed, that they have the right to digitally access the workforce, uh, make some sort of contact with people through through the employer's digital frame, framework and infrastructure. Um, we've seen some great examples of unions, you know, using apps with individual self-employed workers uh, to create communities and, and collectives. We've seen some fantastic uh, examples of, you know, huge... The, the National Education Union had a meeting uh, in 2022 that had over 100,000 participants uh, online in a big, massive sort of Zoom call, uh, you know. So we're finding that a lot of these digital options are giving us a level of connectivity and collectivism that we, we, that we would find very hard to replicate physically. But I would also say you can't beat workers just talking to workers mm. and people having real conversations with each other when it comes to organising a collective. So we've got real challenges, but I think we need to be prepared to use technology creatively to our ends as well in order to support, collectivise and give workers that, that power to be able to get what they need uh, out of their employer. Mm -hmm. And just coming back to the issue of... Um, the, you know, we've had healthcare workers on strike uh, recently, um, and that's the first time, again, probably in my working life, that you can think mm -hmm. you've had frontline healthcare workers prepared to go on strike and yep. prepared to take ballots on that. And you've had a reaction from the UK government that is talking about restricting uh, which professions mm -hmm. can, can take strike action. Uh, do you think, they, uh, I think I know the answer you're going to give me, but, <laughs> but yeah. do you think they have a, a case there that if people, you know, are waiting times in hospitals are long enough as it is and then people are going to have their appointments cancelled or whatever or they can't get treatment, um, is there a case that there's some workers who there should be more, there already are restrictions on them, should there be more mm -hmm. restrictions on them or do you think the balance is in the right place? I'm about to ask Patricia to comment yeah, on that. Yeah, I mean, the, this is uh, the... the, the the UK Tory government have a, a very well-worn playbook of how they deal with trade unions. They try to dis, just vilify them um, and create division among working people and paint, paint us as the, the bad guys, so to speak. Um, this is a very cynical attempt. The actual legislation itself, uh, there are already in every emergency service and, and in hospitals and everywhere that you can imagine where there needs to be life and limb cover for people. There are already copious amount of negotiations that go on whenever there's an industrial action to make sure that nobody's ever going to come to any harm in our key essential public services. It's always been that way. Um, numerous, uh, and it would be good to hear the ILO's view on, on the UK legislation, actually, uh, if, if, if Dr Peels is, is familiar with it, because you know, numerous international organisations have said this is completely unnecessary and, and will achieve nothing. Um, and really, it's about the UK government trying to vilify trade unions. But ultimately, it's about putting another hurdle and another barrier in the way of the right to strike. This is one of the hardest countries in the world to be able to take legal industrial action. The level of ballots uh, and turnout that you have to achieve uh, in order to democratically show that you have a mandate to take industrial action are already, you know, the bar is very, very high. Every time they set it higher, workers get over that bar. Uh, because when, when workers feel they've been unjustly treated, they will get round any barrier in order to be able to, to act together if they feel strongly enough. Mm -hmm. So all it is about is costing trade unions more money, uh, making us jump through more hoops, making it harder to be able to operate. And ultimately, it's about trying to take away people's right to strike. Um, and if we don't have the right to strike, we are fundamentally slaves. And I don't want to live in a country that treats us like that. The Scottish government's made it clear, thankfully, that they completely disagree uh, with this legislation. And I think any civilised country uh, wouldn't want to be moving away from people having the fundamental human right to withdraw their labour and take industrial action. Um, sadly, we've got a UK government that's talking about walking away from human rights uh, mm -hmm. acts and everything else. So uh, we're in a very, very 
disturbing and concerning place when it comes to some of the UK government's policies at the moment. Take away a right to strike, take away a right to protest. What are you left with? Um, I, I was going to bring Patricia in, but I'll maybe see if Dr Peels would want to respond to Ros and how you see the UK uh, government relations in terms of trade union legislation. And then I'm going to open up to questions um, from the audience. Um, yeah, thank you for that. On, on the particular UK case, I, um, I, I, I do not know that um, sufficiently in detail to comment on that, but indeed, like... Um, there, there is the right of industrial action, the, the, the right to strike, and we see that in many countries in the world, uh, one way to undermine uh, that right is by excluding particular type of jobs or group of workers um, from that right based on the argument of having an essential service so that has to uh, that has to continue. So even in times of of strike, so that that's kind of a, um, I think a, a common strategy to to undermine the right with which we, um, of course, certainly um, do not um, agree. And we have a supervisory mechanism um, of the ILO, which um, provides opinions, um, um, which interprets uh, legislations, government actions um, in light, uh, to which extent that violates, for instance, the international labor standards or the ILO standard uh, on that topic. So um, that's a whole, um, yeah. Um, and a whole bunch of data where we can go through um, so that we can always um, look at that um, after the facts. I think it's also uh, just from a democratic perspective, I think what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Ross uh, referred to, um, I think it is industrial action is key. It is a, it is a basic uh, condition of a, of a, democ of a democracy, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association. So I think it's important that we, that we say that. Um, um, that's right. Um, I think also uh, talking about care workers a little bit, the point that I, I made before, I think uh, during uh, COVID-19, I think everybody realized how um, um, essential that, that job is, um, 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 particularly in the context of, of corona, but also in terms of all the, all the working conditions. I think from the perspective, there is also a positive attitude and public perception. Um, that everybody accepts or there is a kind of an openness towards industrial action in that sector um, at the moment. Um, I've been taking notes while the colleagues were talking, but yeah, maybe I, I don't need that this. Thank you, thank you. Um, right, I'll now take uh, questions from the audience. If you put your hand up, um, somebody can bring you a mic or if your voice carries enough, we could just do that. And if you keep your questions um, concise, we can get as many people in um, as we as I can. Um, I'll take I'll, I'll take you first then, I'll take you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Thanks so much for the contributions so far. Um, I just want to also, I just want to hopefully mention something that's not been mentioned in this talk is about disabled workers because I've, I've got autism I'm a disabled I'm a disabled worker and I think this is something that's lost in sometimes conversations within unions and stuff like that is how do we support disabled workers especially people who like myself who try and assert for Equality Act 2010 rights uh, for like reasonable adjustments and things like that and we have to go through like a lot of hoops and we've got to go through a lot of very difficult and very inaccessible like access to justice for ourselves to get access to that and i'm just wondering how can we assert our rights how can we basically how can we disabled people come together in unity and come collectively to really to, to do something about that because right now um, if you look at for example the statistics of people who have got autism I've got autism myself who are in employment it's only what like three to eight percent and and the thing and, and that's quite a shocking and then you've got the trade unions and and you've got and I've and I've seen Within, with, within, like, like the working place, and, and I'll, I'll even go quite as far as to say some unions, is that we don't understand about people with autism. We don't understand people with disabilities. We can't understand people with social 
hidden difficulties who mm -hmm. find it difficult to articulate themselves or cannot able to understand that because they don't they just don't see that they don't really see and they cannot navigate that and they don't and it's about the, it's about the unconscious biases of some union organizers who sometimes they, that is caused within that and how do we fundamentally make the unionised, the unions and union organisers and staff members be able to accept people with autism, accept people with that and understand, and not just go understand, but also to go to the point of empathising with them and actually be able to understand them and to take them along on that journey. Because the thing is, I think that, that we need to bring everyone, every single person with us on the journey to to basically to workers' justice. Yeah. And I think that that is so important. And I just want to say thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, I'll, bring, I'll do a, a, a short um, plug for the committee's work that we did uh, a short piece of work earlier this year on the disability em employment gap. And we're committed to coming to look again at that later in the year. At the moment, the government have an ambitious commitment to close that gap. But if we continue at the pace we're going, we're not going to close the gap. And you're right that, you know, we've talked about a tight labour market as well. We need as many people in, in employment as we can get in employment. And there are people who are being left and not getting opportunities when they should be. But, Ros, do you want to come up with the points about trade unions? And... Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that you've made some really, really key points there. And... You know, trade unions certainly aren't perfect. Uh, we're like all other parts of society, and, and often I, I go with the we're as good as our local reps, and so it's up to us to train our local reps to be excellent, if you know what I mean, and and, and to have awareness um, and to support them to access the the information they need. Um, one of the things that the STUC and many unions uh, do is they have self-representative structures uh, for for different. Uh, impacted groups uh, and, and at the STUC we have a disabled workers conference committee and, and a network um, and that actually proved really really important during uh, the pandemic because we made a conscious decision we had a group of trade unionists that were meeting uh, at ministerial level with government on a weekly basis uh, to raise issues that workers were being affected by out there on the front line uh, and it was, it was a constant dialogue of raising issues with the government uh, so that they got a, a true picture of some of the stuff that was going on in the ground and some of the issues. And actually, our Disabled Worker Committee members played a huge role uh, on that for, for very obvious reasons, you know, in picking up some of the specific uh, problems uh, that, that workers with disabilities were, a whole range of different disabilities, uh, we're, we're facing uh, with, you know, with home working, with when when the restrictions started to get lifted, uh, with coming back out into the community, um, a whole range of things that, you know, we wouldn't have picked up on if we hadn't had those structures. I don't think as effectively mm -hmm. as as we were. It was able to give voice to some of those, and also for our uh, dis our members who have disabilities who participate in those structures. Um, it's a very safe place where they can do a deep dive into a lot of the issues. So the, the, the Disabled Workers Conference will meet for like two and a half days and, and, and debate a whole range of policy issues. Um, and then they, they, they can take those policies into the STUC's mainstream policy. They have seats on our General Council, etc. So we do try to set up structures that enable us to really go deep into those areas and take those views on board mm -hmm. but you know absolutely we're not perfect we we need to continually train we need to continually be aware of best practice and that's not just for uh, the, the area of disabilities but it's also around you know gender age um sexuality a whole range of, of areas where we have to make sure that we're representing all groups and we have to understand the way intersectionality around equality issues works and that there are some people who have a much harder time than others and mm -hmm. part of that is about the, the, the experience uh, that they have in society because of uh, being from a, a more disadvantaged group. Mm. So. Patricia, do you feel that the fair work agenda is inclusive enough? Does it recognise the kind of issues that, um, that Ros was talking about or is it just like in one side at the moment it's, is it 
too narrowly focused at the moment, is it? Uh, a one size fits not all at all. So I think that you know when we talk about fair work in Scotland, we we talk about work that offers opportunity, security, respect, fulfilment, and effective voice. That's our that's our mantra, our five dimensions, and that opportunity piece is really important. And it means that everything we do, we look at in relation to not just how workers as a whole experience it, but how distinct categories, particularly people with protected characteristics, but also beyond that, how do, how do pe those people experience the workplace? And when we start to look at the kind of jobs that people have and the access to quality work that people have, we know that it's very varied. We know that it's varied by sex, we know that it's varied by, by ability and disability, we know it's varied by social class. So in all of those areas, the challenge that we have is to identify where the real problem is and think about what leverage you have to try and address that problem. So I think I completely agree with Rose. Trade unions reflect and both are capable of disrupting the society we're in, but they reflect everything that, we, that the wider society does. It took a long time for trade unions to recognise um, in the right way, I guess, the needs of women workers or part-time workers. You know, there's a learning mm -hmm. process there. We know that the disability employment gap in Scotland is, is high. We know that for people with particular disabilities, it's really high. Mm -hmm. And at a time when you have a very tight labour market and when you know that the consequences of good employment for people's lives are really hugely positive, getting people into the labour market, into decent jobs, not into poor jobs, becomes absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. So in everything that, that the Convention tries to do, we try and disaggregate the things that we're interested in to say, how is that impacting on somebody who uh, has a particular type of condition? How is it impacting on somebody with a particular protected characteristic? We know that that varies a lot across occupations. So we know that people with disabilities can manage in some occupations than no, or no others. My own research team, because I do have a, a day job other than the Fair Work Convention, um, my own research team did some work recently on people with epilepsy. And what was really interesting about that was well, there's a terrible disability employment gap for people with epilepsy, and, and it, it's inconsistent with the symptom profile of people with epilepsy. But what became really clear was, A, some people got very good help from their trade unions. They got good support from equality reps. Mm. But what was also clear was that employers had a different view of people who were coming into the organisation than people who were already in the organisation. Mm. So if you were somebody who had who developed epilepsy once you were in, as an adult, perhaps as a result of a, a brain injury or a stroke, perhaps, your, your ability to get reasonable adjustments, often informally rather than formally, was much higher than when you were coming in. So employers had a different type of attitude. They, when they didn't know what a disability was like or they didn't know the person, they were much less likely to be able to respond positive, positive, positively to that. Now, that's where things like having fair work, having equality reps, trade union equality reps, who can do have those sorts of discussions, having union case workers who, again, across the length and breadth of the country, I'd see it in my own union, I see it in my own institution, in my own sector, have the conversations about what are the specific needs of this person, this member of staff with a disability, not the generic ones. So what is it that the employer can do and is, is legally obliged to do um, to make it possible for that person to engage in work to the, in the same terms. So opportunity and making sure that work is fair for everybody, not as some homogenous mass, mm -hmm. but in the categories and, and with the characteristics that we know that people have, that's absolutely central to what we want to deliver in fair work in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And we know, Ros talked about intersectionality, on, on terms of fair work data, we know that poor job quality characteristics bunch around the people who have particular characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, for example, that the, the biggest single stratifying issue in the labour market as to whether or not you access good work or not is social class. It's not a protected characteristic, mm -hmm. but it is something that massively changes your experience with the world of work. Mm -hmm. So understanding the sort of nuances of that and the patterns of that is really, really important. And understanding the trends of that, because the panel have talked about, you know, Raphael's talked about, Catherine's talked about, Rose has talked about precarious work, new forms of work. A lot of those new forms of work are drawing in people who have, dis who have other disadvantage. And precarious work doesn't make that better, it often makes it worse. Yeah. So that, that issue around 
how we understand our particular citizens to be able to experience work is absolutely central to what we want to do. Thank you. Um, would you like to have a question then? I could have indications for any other questions. Come to you after. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, I was just going to go back a little bit to COVID because I think COVID changed quite a lot. And one of the sort of positive things about COVID, if you can say such a thing, was the light that it shone on workers' conditions, for one thing, and also the state of public services. So, you know, um, you couldn't go from sort of heroes to villains. I mean, the public weren't having it. And it sort of struck me how many times people have been interviewed when there have been train strikes, all sorts of things, you know, uh, uh, situations in which people are really inconvenienced. And they still often say, but I, I, I support the right of these people to do it and I see why they're doing it. And I think that is really positive. I think that's like a new uh, direction. And, you know, it does strike me like that the unions have, are performing a kind of political role with a small p in shining a light on the kind of inequalities. And also, you know, what's happening with the sort of privatisation, the sort of rolling. I don't think people were entirely, you know, uh, familiar with sort of what's been going on. You, you'll hardly find anybody now who's not up to, to date with what's happening to public services. And so, you know, it may be that um, for all the inconvenience, people see that, you know, they're holding a line mm -hmm. that needs to be, they're the only people who are holding that line. Thank you, thank you. Um, Patricia, do you want to do a bit, a bit of public perception in there as well? Do you think, because everybody in this room is politically motivated and interested, that's why they're here, <laughs> is that reflective of, I think it's true that that's reflective of society? Has there been a shift in the way in which people see government or see the relationship with trade unions? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to steal Catherine's word here. It's a spectrum, isn't it? But I completely agree with the, with the person posing the question because when you, when you see a vox pop of an industrial dispute, yeah. you're much more likely now to see somebody saying, well, the workers yeah. and they're fighting for the rights. So you're much more likely to see that kind of response. And maybe in the past, you would have seen a little bit less of that. I think the other point that you made, which is crucially important, is... Um, and it's always difficult to see that there were any bright lights from COVID, but certainly an understanding of what constitutes essential work um, was something that became very clear. And it wasn't always closely correlated with high level work. Mm -hmm. It was often, it was the people who, who, who drove buses. It was the people who worked in retail that made sure you could get, your, get, you know, you could get provisions, even if they were a bit awry and disrupted for a while. So that kind of whole thing around, I suppose, what we broadly call a foundational economy, the stuff that we really, really need to carry on, I think it's shone a very strong light on that. I think it also, um, you know, the, the, we had the whole thing about clapping for the NHS and of course we should do that, but I think it also opened up what the nature of those jobs were like. So there's some really good characteristics of working for the NHS in Scotland and in the UK. It has some very positive elements to it. it some really, really challenging job characteristics as well. And I think that people are now more, um, more open to and aware of what doing those jobs were like and, and why it matters if they're not there. Um, and, you know, I'm a professor in a university. If I sat in my house for a year and sat on Zoom, would a lot of people notice a, few, a, little, a little bit? But not the same as if you don't have a delivery driver taking stuff to Tesco or you, don't have, you can't get access to a consultant in the NHS or you don't have a nurse to see in the NHS. Mm -hmm. So I think it did slight, it disrupted a lot of things, I think in a good way, that allowed us to think about what were the demands on people, what did their jobs look like? And so when we move a very short period of time onwards and we're having discussions about whether or not we can afford to pay healthcare workers, you know, that, that creates a bit of a chasm in people's understanding. They think, well, wait a minute, we were, we were applauding them. We know they're very important. Just coming back to just before we, we went to questions, in that context, I think people support foundational economy workers to do what they're doing. And if that's arguing for better pay and better conditions, they support that. Interestingly, if you look at the difference between Scotland and England, and again, it's not a political point, the NHS in Scotland has not had the strikes that you've had in the NHS in England. And the reason for that is not that somehow the Scottish NHS is awash with money. 
it's because it has the most developed form of trade union employer partnership in the UK. It's been around for over 20 years. It took a lot of work to invest in it. It is invested in heavily in the sense that people commit very heavily to having dialogue at every level of the NHS as an organisation, from the very bottom to the very top. And that allows them to be in a position that notwithstanding the real resource challenges on the NHS and the accelerating demand on it, people are able to have a conversation about how you keep the lights on, how you keep the, system, the service running. And I think that's quite a strong contrast at the current period of time between what's happening in the rest of the UK. And that is about well-established forms of social partnership, as, as Raphael mentioned, well-established forms of dialogue, the willingness to compromise and to say, well, we'd like a bit more of this or a bit less of that, that trade unions do every day. That's where you see it in operation. And I think maybe people understand that a bit better now than they did previously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the question over here. Uh, my name's Finlay. I'm the Deputy Convener of the Scottish Youth Parliament's Jobs, Economy, Fair Work Committee. Um, I was wondering what you thought of the outlook for young people's involvement in union membership when it's currently quite low rates, particularly for those under 25, under 21s. How do you deal with young people often entering the workforces, either having little knowledge of their right to unionise or thinking that when when they've got an experience where st stable employment is is a bit of a pipe dream, then seeing how are unions relevant to them and how can they benefit them? Thank you. Uh, you want to go with? Yeah, happy to, to answer that. I think that we're on a, a journey, and I can see lots of seeds of hope actually, and I'm quite optimistic. Uh, about future generations of young people getting involved in trade unions because young people who are in secondary schools across Scotland right now have seen their teachers take collective action and take strike action uh, and you know that affected their daily lives but they also you know had introduced the concept of what a union is and does they saw those teachers get a good deal at the end of that uh, the young people in our universities are seeing their lecturers coming together and taking action and, and fighting back against injustice. Um, and in many cases, we're seeing young people, young students out there, you know, participating and supporting those, those uh, university staff and actually participating in that fight back. Um, so I think young people are a bit more politicised these days. Uh, even when you look, you know, I've got two uh, teenage daughters uh, there's a lot of politics on things like TikTok and all that, and, and a lot of it is around, um, you know, some of the issues, you know, some of it's environmental issues, but a lot of it is about social justice um, issues. And I think trade unions have got a real opportunity at the moment. We have undoubtedly been given a platform. Uh, of really, it, it relates to some of what you were saying as well. Since COVID, uh, people were ignoring trade unions. It's not that trade union... Uh, Leaders like myself weren't spitting out the press releases every week, moaning about the economy and everything else. We were. We were talking about nationalisation uh, of our key public services. We were talking about workers getting a fairer share of the economy. We've never went away. But the difference is that the, the, the mainstream media has sat up and taken notice. Now, we only have that platform because workers have got together on the ground and taken action. Uh, and, and it's affected the economy and it's affected people's lives. But I feel that we have been able to shift the narrative and actually challenge the current economic climate. For years and years in the UK, you couldn't argue with the neoliberal economic policies. Um, you couldn't argue with it's all better off if you just leave it to the market. Um, and I think post-COVID, we've been able to articulate a very effective argument that actually you do need rich people to pay tax into the system. You do need workers to get a fairer share of the economy. You need public services that are well resourced and, and, and that is how you create a well being economy. Um, and you know you need your essential services like water, electricity, gas, these things shouldn't be about making profits for the private mm. sector or, or billionaires at the at the top of our economy. So all of these things uh, 
we've been able to articulate. Last year, pre-budget, the STUC was able to set the narrative uh, around that budget, the, the media narrative around a debate about taxation, progressive taxation, um, and how the Scottish Government could raise £3.2 billion more revenue within their current powers if they chose to. Um, and we're now seeing some of that coming into fruition. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, let's see what comes out of this budget, but we've got a proper a panel of experts being brought together to actually look at some of that work that needs to be done to redistribute wealth in our economy. So it is, it, it, the, the industrial action that's taking place got results, but it's, it's also, I think, going to have far spreading ripples. Uh, and one of those ripples for me is going to be young people now do have a better understanding of what trade unions are because we're in the media more, because we're, we're uh, taking action and winning in institutions that young people use. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty hopeful, uh, having seen the amount of young people that are engaging positively with our agenda. I think that, you know, I have great faith in future generations of trade unionists carrying forward uh, the torch and winning for workers. And then, um, Dr Peel, do you want to, yeah, I see your hand up, do you want to comment <laughs> on uh, Finlay's question? Uh, yeah, may, maybe on that one, and uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Rose. I think um, if unions still want to be relevant tomorrow, there's really an urgent need to organize young workers. Um, we talked uh, previously about trade union membership. Uh, we know that trade union membership in the age cohort of 55 to 65 is much higher um, than um, in the among young workers. So knowing that trade union membership is already going down, knowing that this age cohort that is highly unionized is going to retire soon and be replaced by a new cohort that is uh, much more lower uh, in unionization that will uh, strengthen these figures of, of, um, of pressure on trade union uh, membership. And I think what is key is not only to organize this work, but also making sure that the young workers have a voice in the whole internal governance of the union and also that um, the whole repertoire of action, the whole uh, not only agenda setting and um, the ways of working with unions also reflect this interest of the workers. We, I, I think uh, Ross mentioned, um, youngsters are interested in, in social justice. And I think that's true. We know that, that the youngsters are interested in the contents of unionism, but not necessarily in the way of doing things uh, by unions. So I think that is really a challenge. I'm not necessarily saying that unions should do it differently, but at least, or um, communicate that message better, or um, relate in a way to and the topics and, and the ways of framing things and the way of speaking that can be through apps, digital services, uh, talking about the topics um, that they care about, not only social justice, but also just transition, sexual identity, um, etc. So just a little addition to that. OK, thank you. Um, do I have other questions uh, over here? Thank you. Um, my name's Wendy. I was just wondering, there's a lot of talk about membership and thinking from a younger perspective, not my generation, but what you were saying. I just wondered if networks was more the thing rather than joining and becoming a member in that something, a structure that can be fluid and that you could come in and out of something. Um, I work in the arts and I know that we followed a model where we wanted to join networks and the sign up for the networks was so much more than if we set ourselves up as a membership because it was about who you identified with at a given moment. And I just wonder if some of the trade union language and uh, structure, particularly the language and perception, is a bit analogue. Um, a lot of it reminds me of the 70s. It's solid, it's good, but I'm not sure that I think it's um, uh, peripatetic and, um, you know, you might identify with it uh, at some point and then perhaps just um, sit back a little bit but come back again with something else, if it allows you to do that in terms of the perception. So, you know, I think networks can be a, a lot more attractive than a membership. And I know you need money, but networks can also bring in money. Mm -hmm. 
So, Ros, do you want to respond to that? Because you mentioned the Unite Hospitality campaign yeah, yeah. earlier, and that was a union going into an area where people, it was younger people, a lot of it was in transitionary That's work, right. um, but they weren't unionised, and yeah, it was but, a really good campaign. I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think that we have to adapt to survive as trade unions, and, you know, we... It's, it's getting that balance right. You don't want to throw the baby mm. out with the bathwater. You know, a lot of our democratic structures and things have been around for a long, long time. They, they do seem quite archaic and very traditional, um, but they kind of work to create policy and, and, and you know, uh, do debate and, and come out with an outcome at the end of it that everyone can get behind. Uh, and we are democratic institutions, so how we develop our policy how we take forward decisions about to, to accept a pay offer or not accept a pay offer. Some of these things are, are quite clunky for kind of like for a reason, if you know what I mean, uh, and quite slow. But for a reason, uh, democratic organisations always find making, being, being agile quite tricky. But I do agree that, uh, you know, we've seen some really good innovation take place. We've seen in some industries where we have a high level of self-employment or, or workers that are sort of uh, freelance and things like that. We've seen some really good use of things like apps for industry-wide agreements and, and things like that. Um, actually, globally, uh, there was a huge uh, strike action. Again, Dr Peels might know more about this than me, but... I believe one of the biggest industrial actions that have taken place in recent years happened in India among women, uh, women domestic workers, and a lot of it was done by mobile phone and app, and people literally voting yes or no through their app. Um, there was lots of different workers employed by lots of different small employers, but they, they came together uh, in a huge way. Um, so there's, there's some really interesting stuff out there. Uh, Unite Hospitality have, have got some really interesting models as well, where they're able to support people to stay in membership um, because they've got big service sector branches that have got the funds to be able to support people, whether they're in or out of work, and they've kind of come to ways of fudging around the traditional union rules to build their membership, to support young people um, and to keep, you know, building even though people could be in and out of work um, and going to different places. So I think we have to be open to that. We have to keep, uh, like for the STUC as well, this year we're going to be doing a review of all of our democratic structures and events uh, because we think that they need to be modernised, we need to make sure they're inclusive, we need to make sure they're reflecting best practice, and we, we, we kind of need to make sure that if somebody walks into the room for the first time to participate, that they're not going to get put off by a whole range of jargon and language that takes you 10 years of being a trade union activist to learn how to play the game. So there's all of that that I think we, we should constantly challenge ourselves with. And, you know, to me, it is that, that old adage of uh, we've got to adapt and evolve to survive and be most effective. And that's what we're there for, is to do a good job for working people and, and win for them, win mm -hmm. for workers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yep. And went back. What I might do is take the two questions one after the other and let the panel, because we're getting a wee bit short of time, but I'll take both. Yeah, um, you slightly covered it a wee bit already, but I was wondering if you could just speak a wee bit more to the, the sort of spectrum of public support for industrial action across different sectors. For example, um, nurses and other NHS workers, generally a lot of public support for that. But then when you go across to, say, teachers, for example, like my cousin's a teacher, she said she felt herself a lot of opposition in general, whether it was parents or just whoever. I think maybe last year as well, this time last year when we had the strikes for the, uh, the pe uh, bin men, um, there was a, I also felt like talking to my colleagues and stuff, there was much less support for industry action in those yeah. sectors. So I suppose I'm just asking about kind of, a, I suppose it's a problem mm -hmm. of communication again, maybe, and just the sort of, um, the difficulties and the opportunities for sort of overcoming that and so on. Thank you. And if I get the question from the lady at the back and then we'll get responses. And these will be the, unless anybody else, if you want another question, put your hand up now, these will be the last two. Um, so I absolutely agree. I think there's a place for trade unions and workers' rights. Um, I really just wanted to ask a question based on 
reference to the NHS, I think the red reference should be to care workers because there's a whole raft of workers that are going to get higher and higher in our sense of need as a population as the demographic age increases. Um, so I think the question that I would like to ask is how do we ensure that we have a, a societal conversation about the workers we value and what they should be paid and how do we continue to ensure a fair relativity to the value of different jobs across our society that we think that we need mm -hmm. in the future? Where do the trade unions sit with that? Mm -hmm. And effectively, it's the next generation of fair work in policy terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's a big question to end with. But when we start with... I suppose we'll wrap both questions up, but public perception, and we know that in... Hollywood, the writers are about to go on strike. If people aren't going to see their favourite TV programme, they might start to lose sympathy in that area. But they are going on strike because of concerns about the changing environment, about AI and about um, a threat that they see coming down to their livelihood. Um, but I don't know, Patricia, do you want to come in first and maybe respond to the uh, woman at the back about how do we see a fair society? How do we reward work appropriately and what do we value? So I think connecting the two questions and, and, and maybe the question prior to that I think this is what runs through all of those questions is an issue about public debate and public consciousness the extent to which we have a public debate about workers about the provision of services about what resources are and aren't available and how those resources are distributed so I think that's a it's a higher level debate about the kind of society that we want to be and what decisions we have to take and what actions we have to take to be that society. So, so coming back to our colleague over there's question, uh, we want young people to be having the conversations about whether or not, um, whether or not you should organise in a particular way, whether the form of organisation is right for you, whether it's attractive for you. I do think we have an awareness gap in some of these areas around not just fair work, which we think is an aspiration way beyond minimum entitlements, but about basic rights that people have at work. I think a lot of people are not necessarily very well informed about their own basic rights. And I think we do need to really raise the level of public debate about the kind of society that we want to be and how we deliver that. Mm -hmm. and, and, that and that means trying to, bring, to come back to your question, trying to bring an awful lot of people with you who might start from, if you're a parent trying to put your children into school in the morning, and the teachers are on strike and you're really concerned about that because actually your boss is not very nice and he's not, he or she is not great if you're absent and you're, you're dealing with your challenging work while you're trying to cope with some other work-life balance issues. So it's a sort of trying to open up those conversations whereby improving the level of decent work quality for all of us actually improves, it, you know, it has impacts across the board. And I think that debate is really important. It's really important about where our priorities are. So when you're, uh, you're correct to talk about the importance of not just health workers, but care workers. We have health and social care integration in Scotland. We're supposed to treat the two sectors in the same way, but it is self-evident that we don't. It's very different to be a care worker than it is to work in the NHS. There are huge differences in, te in terms of the experiences of work in, in both of those uh, sectors. And in part, it is to do with the fact that social care is a mixed economy of public, private and third sector providers and the NHS is entirely publicly funded um, and publicly provided. So therefore, the level of trade union organisation and partnership within that is much more extensive. But it is about having the discussion up front, not pretending that we can hide behind the fact that social care looks slightly different to, the, to health and leave the burden of that and the burden of the increasing demand for social care on the back of what are generally poorly paid women workers. That's, we, we have to have that debate, and it comes back to the point Ros made earlier, and we have to recognise the consequences of that debate. If that means that we don't pay for some things and we pay for other, we should be having that discussion publicly. If that means that we need to raise tax for some people and not for others to be able to deliver that, that's the conversation we should be having. We can't, we can't do these things without being upfront and clear about the consequences of them. And I think that would, a far better civic consciousness and civic, in, civic engagement with the world of work would be really important. One of the things that's been really interesting about fair work, and we're a tiny convention with not, you know, with, with the reach, that, the best reach that we can deliver. But one of the things that's really interesting is we don't have a lot of public policy on the workplace in the UK. We don't have a lot of law and legislation, and we're a quite lightly regulated labour market. But we should be having a debate about what happens in the workplace 
because it is crucially important to the quality of the rest of our lives. So that debate about the workplace, I think, is, is facilitated by us saying you're entitled to fair work. You're not just entitled to minimum standards. You're a young person. You should know what fair work is. And you should know that you're entitled to ask your employer to deliver it. Um, so, so I think it's that level of debate that we really need to push up to try and get a more a, a broader civic consensus about how we make what are undoubtedly quite tough decisions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patricia. Um, Dr Peel, I'm going to come to you now for maybe reflection on the last couple of questions, but also any closing remarks. And I'm wondering if, having listened to the discussion we've had uh, here in this room this afternoon, if this is typical of discussions that are taking place across Europe, for example, countries that are similar to us, are they having the same kind of discussions about uh, trade union relationships and how we prioritise our public spending and how we um, sustain our resources? Um, yes. So that's probably quite a lot um, to ask at the, at the end. Yeah, of I know. Maybe, maybe I, I, I stick to one. So um, yeah, you choose what you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm taking something together what Ross mentioned, the voice of Patricia. Um, I think in a context uh, of a lot of change and uncertainty, uh, multiple crises, and this will, will keep on will, will keep on coming. Um, we say we have to organize better young workers, but also uh, people with disability. Um, we have to take a stance on just transition, technology change. So this will never, yeah. this will never stop. Um, as, as I know, we have been doing some exercises with unions in strategic foresight, where we really try to look long term uh, what are the big trends and drivers of change, uh, demographic change, technological change between now and, and 20 years. What does that mean for the labor market and that for unions? I think that is. Um, an interesting um, exercise that brings me a little bit to the point of, Pat of Patricia. It's an, it's an overall political decision on what type of society we want um, to have. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working for the ILO where everything we do is negotiated um, with um, also with governments from all over the world, so not only the more enlightened governments who may have a, a, a kind of a more open stance towards fair work, but also more uh, conservative or, or critical governments in, in other parts of the world um, on, the, on a diversity topic, but also with the private sector. And I think there are really clear uh, interests in society, so it's really tough to get to that consensus if I see on every type of document we try to adapt. We've had a, a long-standing debate, for instance, on living wage, um, to make sure that kind of a minimum wage is a wage that allows you to live in decency. Even there, there um, this is the private sector has a very, has a very critical stance in that. Um, so on every topic that we discuss, um, I think it is, it is really a tough, a tough fight, I think. So it is true, it's a question to find the consensus in society, but it's also a collection of clear interests and diverging uh, interests in society. And the reason why we end up with a lot of uh, diverse types of work that is also a concrete, um, I think, strategy to undermine the whole um, uh, body of existing legislation that we have been able to develop over over, no, over multiple over multiple decades. So, anyway, as a political scientist, I wanted to make uh, uh, a political statement that um, this broader consensus is also a clear reflection of uh, interests and values in societies, and maybe that also then explains a little bit um, what is the perception um, around unions um, um, but also around uh, broader institutions and government etc in the world uh, of work so i don't know if i respond to your question and i don't know if this is actually helping but yeah thank you yeah I'll, I'll well, that's, that's great thank you thank you very much um, and catherine if i may come to you for any closing uh, comments i mean the session is called workers rights who cares um, does the Institute of Directors care? Do your members care about workers' rights? You've talked about a spectrum and a, and a range, but the big challenges that have been discussed this afternoon, you represent SMEs. Is, is this relevant to SMEs, this discussion? Yes, think? absolutely, it is, because SMEs are exactly the businesses that are struggling to find the talent and the skills that they need to fill the gaps that they've got when they're looking at growth and development. So absolutely, um, this is a, a discussion that needs to happen more and more and more across sector, across industry. You know, trade unions is, is, is one aspect of it, but actually when you look at, you know, fair work in the round, you know, we, we did our State of the Nation survey, we do it every year with our members, we asked about fair work principles 
and half of our members reported that they, they, they didn't know what they were. Mm -hmm. um, now, that, that's a problem. And um, the irony is when you start to talk to people on an individual basis, they're like, oh, yeah, we do that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it's, it's, the, it's the language. They, they don't get it. So I, I think conversations like this are critical. Um, and just in terms of kind of my own kind of thoughts and comments, aside from being in awe of my fellow panellists and just how incredible they are, um, it's a really turbulent environment right now and we're all navigating it in our own way and I think we talk about engagement but we need to go that step further it's not just about engagement it's about collaboration and dialogue because that's how we take that step forward that we need to. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much Catherine and Ros do you have any final um, comments or reflections on this afternoon's discussion? Yeah and I think just relating back to the the, the final questions um, about public support and perception and, and, and how aware the public are of the, the big issues going on and, and how they get behind workers and, and also about that care question. I mean, for me, social dialogue is all very well, but being in the room isn't enough. T ten years of the Scottish Government has shown us that. We've had access up to our eyeballs. We're in every conversation. We're consulted to the ends of the earth. They like to have a fair work minister. They like to talk about the wellbeing economy. They like to talk about a just transition. But to get real results for real workers on the ground, like your care workers, you know, we did, I, I sat on the, the, the Fair Work Convention, we did a report four years ago telling them what they had to do to value the women workers who work in care. And we've still seen zilch in terms of a serious collective bargaining model for that sector and a serious uh, valuing of, of those workers, even though it's predominantly public sector funded. And the reality is nothing worth fighting for is ever given. Power is never ceded unless we really, really do get together and fight for it. So democracies are all about power. Big business has huge power. They fund political parties. They fund newspapers and the media. They exercise power in hidden ways. But we, the people, have massive power as well. And trade unions are one of the most effective vehicles the working class has to exercise their power and create real change in society and win a fairer share of the economy. And the wealth that exists, the plentiful wealth that exists in our economy for ordinary working people. And sometimes that causes inconvenience, but that is on us to get out there and organise and build political awareness. Um, and that happens community by community, workplace by workplace. We have so much we need to do, but you know it is worth fighting for. And, and I believe that we can make a real difference when we come together, we fight back and we make demands of the people in power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ros. Um, that was a great reality check from Ros at the end, because I think everybody here in the room does value trade unions and do think they're still important, but there are still uh, battles to be won and nothing is, is won easy. It is, a, it is often a struggle. And um, so thank you everybody for coming on this afternoon. Uh, thank you to Raphael, to Patricia, to Ros and Catherine for leading the discussion and for all their uh, answering questions uh, this afternoon. Uh, there is a survey that if you booked via Eventbrite, I think the survey will be sent to you, but there's also some paper copies here if you can take time to fill them in, that would help us uh, very much. Um, there are some more festival events today and tomorrow. I don't know if you've managed to catch other things um, over the last few days. Um, and there's one today at half five on radical uses for Scotland's land. Um, I think there's also a culture one this evening. I did have a meeting with uh, the festival's director this morning and she's coming along to take part in that. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you'll be able to come to other things, but just uh, thank you once again for attending this one. I hope you found it interesting and we'd welcome your feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs>